Welcome to the online targeted grazing workshop for 2015. This is a series of five modules uh, on targeted grazing for vegetation management and landscape enhancement. It's brought to you by the Society for Range Management Targeted Grazing Committee. We have several partners that have helped us put together these uh, workshops. Uh, we hope you've been able to join us for the other four workshops in this series. And those are available at our website, um, targetedgrazing.wordpress.com. So let's get started today. I'm Karen Launchbaugh, and I will be giving today's presentation on diet selection basics. I've had a long, strong interest in targeted grazing since I grew up on a ranch in western North Dakota and started watching animals graze and trying to figure out their patterns. Um, after my ranching time, I went to school at North Dakota State, Texas A&M, and then I finished with a PhD from Utah State University, all in, it, in range science. I'm currently a rangeland ecologist at the University of Idaho, and my current research focuses mostly on using targeted grazing for fuels management on wildlands and also invasive plant control. You probably know about the targeted grazing handbook that was published a few years ago by the American Sheep Industry Association. Um, I was one of the co-authors of that and had the pleasure of working with John Walker and several of the members of the Targeted Grazing Committee to put that handbook together. I'm also past chair of the Targeted Grazing Committee. So let's get started with diet selection basics. This presentation was originally created on April 9th and presented online. This is a re-recording of that online version as the quality of the audio was not very good. So here we are with diet selection basics. This is all the science behind what we know about why animals select what they do. So there's a lot of experiments that I hope to explain to you to kind of take some of the mystery out of how animals know what to eat and what to avoid. Before we get going, I need to distinguish between a couple of terms, palatability and preference. Palatability is a plant term. It's related to the attractiveness of a plant to an animal. So we think of it as a pleasant flavor or a, an amount of energy, but really it's just a characteristic that when you say a plant is palatable, you're just saying that animals find it attractive or they like it. Preference, on the other hand, is an animal term. When you give a, an animal a choice between a couple of plants, the one that they choose, that action of choosing it is called a preference. Both of these terms are an interrelationship between post-ingestive feedback and the flavor of the food. So an animal eats a food and it's connected to post-ingestive feedback in the form of nutrients and toxins. And I'll explain that in more detail come, you know, in the subsequent slides. Um, the key is that um, whether an animal chooses a plant or not, or whether a plant is palatable or not, is really a relationship between the animal, the plant characteristics, and the animal's experience with the food. At the heart of this relationship between flavor and feedback is the fact that um, behavior depends on consequences. Basic, basic um, principles of behavior made popular most, uh, like, most by uh, B.F. Skinner. And, but it's the idea that if an animal does something, and that action or that behavior is followed by positive consequences, the likelihood of the animal repeating that behavior will increase. And the opposite of true is true of negative consequences. If an animal does something and it's followed by negative consequences, the animal will not likely, is not likely to repeat that behavior. So we, do, we use this basic principle in training horses and dogs and even members of our family to do what we want them to do. And it's at the heart of diet selection also. Okay, so let's look at this relationship of behavior and consequences in the in um, light of food. So an animal eats food, that's the behavior. It's followed by some digestive consequences or uh, feedback. If that feedback is positive in the form of nutrients and energy, the animal will form a preference for the food. If the feedback is negative, especially if, it's, if the animal feels nauseous after eating a food, then the animal forms an aversion to the food. If a preference is formed, the animal is likely to repeat that behavior and to seek that food out again and eat it. If the consequences are negative, the animal is likely to not repeat that behavior and in fact avoid the plant in the future. The reason that this relationship between flavor and consequences is so strong is because our bodies are really designed to relate flavor to consequences. And that's how we detect nutrients and toxins in foods. There are a whole bunch of nerves in your, in, the, in your mouth, in the animal's mouth, 
the buccal cavity that are related to uh, nerves and cells in the gut that tell uh, or give indication of the nutrients or toxins in food. And all of that is kind of goes through the area posterior at the very base of the of the brain. So these are really deep in our genetic history in terms of nearly every animal has this ability to relate to flavors, to consequences. And so it's, it's sort of the wisdom of the body. It's the way that we're designed to detect nutrients and toxins and relate them to flavors. Okay, let's take a look now a little more closely at how nutrients increase palatability of foods. Animals learn to eat foods that are nutritious and avoid foods that are of low nutrients. And their bodies are just tell them which food um, is appropriate based on the feedback from the gut. So let's take a closer look at this preference then. Here was a very interesting experiment done in the 90s by Juan Vialba and Fred Provenza out of Utah State University. Pretty simple experiment, but it really showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that animals can relate nutrients to foods and form uh, a strong uh, preference or palatability for them. A uh, simple experiment had two groups of sheep. Group one on the odd days of the week received onion flavored straw with no particular feedback. Group two received oregano flavored straw on even days. Group one received oregano flavored straw, but got uh, some starch that was um, delivered directly to the room and through a tube. So they had water and starch, and it was delivered to the room, and so it was an energy source. Group two got onion flavored straw and also got that energy source. And then they were given a choice between onion or oregano flavored straw. The results were clear, even from the first test period. Animals preferred the straw the flavor of straw that was related to the starch um, feedback, so the energy feedback. And as the experiment went on through periods two, three, and four, the more often animals had experience with this food, the more that they formed a preference for the flavor that was related to the energy feedback. I did a similar experiment using sheep and straw with uh, one of my graduate assistants, Elizabeth Smith, here at the University of Idaho. We were interested in how animals kind of know which are the highest quality foods. We, we know, for example, that sheep prefer barley over straw, even though if you put these foods in um, a bomb calorimeter, they may have very similar energy forms. And then furthermore, how do animals um, have form preferences for foods that are more digestible or have more soluble carbohydrates um, over foods that are digestible but are fermented carbohydrates, so they take longer to get feedback from them? So we proposed that perhaps the timing of feedback was important. I uh, had three groups of sheep. We fed them different flavors of straw. And when the sheep got one flavor of straw, they got starch delivered to their um, rumen within 90 minutes of eating it. Other flavors, they got straw. And then the feedback was delivered eight hours later to approximate a fermented carbohydrate or a fermented uh, compound in, in foods. The, the final group, they got no feedback. They just got water both one hour and seven hours after um, they eat the straw. Our results were somewhat similar to what Vialba and Provenza found in that um, animals preferred foods that were related to feedback. So both the red and, or the, the yellow and green bars in this case had stronger preference than foods that just had water as feedback. But we t um, got a little bit more information from this and found that animals formed stronger preferences for foods that gave them a fairly immediate positive feedback versus delayed. So that would explain why animals can uh, form preferences for highly digestible foods over foods that might have the same energy but require fermentation. The lambs prefer foods that give energy boost shortly after they are eaten in this case. Okay, let's take another, let's take a look at the aversion side of this uh, equation. We know that animals learn to avoid foods that are toxic and that their bodies tell them which foods are harmful based on the feedback from the gut. So how do toxins decrease palatability? Well, the, an, an, a simple experiment uh, was done in the 80s by Beth uh, Burrett and Fred Provenza at Utah State. Um, Beth had two groups of sheep. She um, allowed them to eat mountain mahogany a perfectly uh, fine food for sheep. They, they like it. She gave them potted plants of mountain mahogany. One group of sheep, she gave uh, uh, capsules of lithium chloride at a rate of about three grams a day. 
and the other group just got empty capsules. The reason that Beth used lithium chloride in this experiment is because it is a compound that is known to have um, you know, very few effects on the animal, except that we do know that it has the side effect of making uh, mammals sick or, or nauseous in this case. So it's pretty well um, dis, uh, described and uh, used in, uh, uh, in experiments about diet selection. So one, animal, one group of animals ate mountain mahogany, got nauseous. The other group of animals ate mountain mahogany and had no feedback. And then she gave the sheep uh, uh, an opportunity to eat mountain mahogany. Uh, really simple. On the first day of the experiment, before either animal had received any kinds of feedback, they both liked mountain mahogany at a rate of, in this case, she, she measured a number of bites of mountain mahogany. The second day, the controls started eating more. That's the top blue line. They started increasing their intake over time. By the second day, the animals that had received lithium chloride went straight off mountain mahogany, and by day three, they, they wouldn't even look at mountain mahogany. So they had formed a strong aversion because every time they took a bite of it, they received negative feedback. So clearly, when animals eat something and it makes them ill, they avoid that food. We also know that the, not just the timing of feedback, but also the magnitude of feedback is important. When an animal eats a food and it feels um, a lot better, it has very positive consequences, it will form a preference. And if the consequences are strongly negative, um, the animal forms a strong aversion. There was an experiment done in the 90s by Johan Dutoy um, to really try to um, clarify this uh, magnitude of feedback and if it really was important in um, altering animals' preference or aversion to food. He had uh, six groups of sheep. In this case, he gave them all a pelleted feed, a pelleted ration. And one group of sheep got zero grams of lithium chloride or, or no feedback. Next group got a little bit more, one gram, and then two grams, three grams, five grams. And so the last group that got ate, ate the pelleted food and got eight grams of lithium chloride. And then uh, Johan gave the sheep a choice between this pelleted feed and also alfalfa uh, pellets, which was uh, a common food uh, or a familiar food to the sheep. And sure, it was the results were really clear. The sicker the animal got after eating this pelleted ration, the stronger their aversion to it, or the more they avoided it. So, animals that had zero um, feedback or one gram of lithium chloride, they had about an equal preference for the pelleted feed and the alfalfa pellets. But then you'll see two, three, five, and eight grams of feedback, which, assuming that's making animals sicker and sicker. Um, cause stronger and stronger aversions. Um, we also know that animals can mediate how much they eat to adjust how how ill they get. Um, the, almost, oh geez, most all foods on rangelands and pastures have something in them that if an animal ate too much, they would get ill. And, and so animals can't avoid every food that would make them ill. They have to learn to kind of adjust their intake of toxic foods below some threshold level. At least that's what we um, hypothesized when um, I did this experiment with Dr. Bavenza at Utah State in the 90s. We were wondering if sheep could, if, if toxins set limits to the amount of intake that animals eat. So we had three groups of sheep in this case. We gave them oats that had lithium chloride mixed right in. And lithium chloride is, is a salt, so it just made the food salty. One group of sheep had oats with no lithium chloride. One had uh, oats with 0.75% lithium chloride, and the final group had oats with twice as much lithium chloride, or 1.5%. And then we had, uh, we just measured daily intake of oats. And what we found was the sheep that had no lithium chloride ate pretty much all I gave them. I gave them 500 grams a day, and that top bar, they ate everything I gave them every day. The second group had, they ate less oats because it had the lithium chloride in them, which presumably made them ill. And the, the group that had twice as much lithium chloride ate half as much oats. So in other words, the, uh, the lithium chloride really was um, changing or setting a limit to how much those sheep were willing to eat. You'll see that kind of blip on day six and seven. I'm not sure why they ate more that day. It probably was just a barometric pressure issue or something. Both groups ate a little bit more that one day. So the bottom line is the animals ate uh, foods to kind of stay below some kind of limit that might have made them ill. 
w another way that animals avoid toxic foods is not only to change how much they eat, but to really be careful with unfamiliar foods. So one thing we know is that animals avoid unfamiliar foods. Um, that's called neophobia. Uh, a simple experiment that Dr. Vivenza did, he had intake of oats, which was a new food for the sheep. So on day one, they didn't eat too much. Day two, they ate a little more. Three, four, five, six, it was becoming more and more familiar to them. They were eating more and more of it. And then on day seven, Dr. Ravenza added a novel flavor to the food. He added onion powder to the rice. And the results were that animals really decreased their intake on day seven because now that they added a novel flavor, so the animals were experiencing or expressing neophobia or a fear of new things, including food in this case. Uh, after a day of just kind of sticking off of it, they started increasing intake again. But that avoidance of novel foods and flavors is called neophobia. And, and we know that animals avoid novel foods, so we assume that they're taking a few bites to see how the feedback is for those foods. Um, we also know that novelty is important, a uh, clue to help animals distinguish between what made them sick and what didn't. This was an experiment that was done by um, Bert, Beth Burt and Fred Vivenza at Utah State again. And um, they were looking to see if animals blame the novel food. So uh, with a group of sheep, Beth gave them uh, five foods. Top three, barley, oats, and alfalfa were all familiar to them. The, another one, corn, had made them ill in a previous experiment, and rye was a novel food. So she gave the animals a meal that included all five of those foods, and then uh, she gave them a dose of lithium chloride, and then she gave them all five foods again and looked at their intake. And the results were quite clear. On the day before the dosing of lithium chloride, animals ate uh, barley, oats, alfalfa, and corn, and rye all well. Then the lithium chloride and the, and the food that they went off of was the rye. Rye was the novel food, so they actually blamed their illness on the novel food. They also decreased their intake of corn because that was a food that had made them ill in the past, but they did not decrease their intake of any of the familiar foods. So when animals get ill, they avoid new foods or foods that had made them ill in the past. This is really important because um, animals don't eat one food at a time. They eat um, many foods during the day, and they need to have signals to figure out which food it was that made them ill. And now we know that novelty and prior illness are two clues that animals use to decide what made them ill. So based on this previous experiment by Beth Burrett and Fred Provenza, we thought that perhaps animals' previous life experiences might give them clues to what foods might be toxic or nutritious when they encounter new foods in the future. And actually, I was interested in things like knowing that sagebrush kind of smells similar depending on species. So wondering, for example, if an animal ate one species of sagebrush, would they know about potential um, digestive consequences of new species when they might encounter them? So to answer this question about whether previous experience gives animals clues about foods when they encounter them in the environment, we had two sets of sheep and we fed them all, both cinnamon rice, which was a new food for them. So we fed, I fed it to them for several days till they got used to it. Uh, one group of sheep um, ate cinnamon rice and got no negative feedback. The other group um, got lithium chloride when they ate cinnamon rice, so um, they became averted to it. And then we gave the sheep a choice between cinnamon flavored wheat and plain wheat. So wheat was a new food for them. They'd never had it before, but it had this common flavor and the results were quite interesting. Not surprisingly, animals that had been averted to cinnamon-flavored rice did not like cinnamon-flavored wheat. They actually ate plain wheat much more than they ate cinnamon-flavored wheat. Those animals who had eaten cinnamon-flavored rice uh, accepted cinnamon-flavored wheat just fine. It was a it was a, a familiar food, I mean, a familiar flavor to them, and it had not caused them digestive um, negative digestive consequences. So they they continued to eat it. So the bottom line is then that um, experiences in the past do give animals clues uh, to new foods. So not every single novel food in the environment is completely new to the animal. And this is important when you're thinking about targeted grazing because um, knowing sort of experiences animals had with similar foods in the past may influence whether or not they will eat them in the future. So how do animals know which foods made them ill? If even when they eat many foods in a day, 
that many factors play a role. One, we know for sure, um, if an animal becomes ill or starts to feel significantly better, they'll blame the novel food over the familiar food. So new consequences are blamed on new foods. We know that generalization is a key, so past experiences do uh, affect future uh, choices, uh, and that's called generalization. So past experiences also, uh, whether they were negative or positive, and then common flavors in the new foods. Amount eaten is also important. So if an animal eats a lot of one food, even if it's familiar, and they become ill, they will tend to blame that food that they ate a lot. And then finally, timing. If, uh, if an animal becomes ill, they will often um, attribute that illness to the last food they eat. What was, the, what was the one most recently eaten? So these are all really important features if you are trying to create or avoid an aversion in animals, knowing whether that food is familiar or whether it's novel, whether it's whether the plant you're trying to get animals to eat is similar to other plants they've had in the past, and then how much they've eaten and timing. So all of those will help you understand why animals eat or avoid foods. So another really important factor that influences which plants an animal chooses or avoids is mother. Mother is a social model. She has social influences on the animal, and she is the imp most important social influence on animals, especially when they're young. She's important because, first of all, she was obviously successful. So she, um, so her success is sort of passed on from gener generation to generation in genes, in in that animals pay attention to mother um, because she obviously was successful. And she's also there when an animal is born. Um, at least with mammals, mother is usually there. She's usually present, so she's a model that is there. And then finally, she has uh, similar abilities as her offspring. So you know we look at these animals, for example, in these pictures, and they have similar coloring. They look like their mother on the outside, but they also look like their mother on the inside from a physiological, neurological, and digestive morphological aspect. So foods that might be toxic or beneficial to mother may be toxic or beneficial to her young also. So mother's a super important social model. Here was an ex uh, extremely influential experiment that was done by Dr. Green and colleagues in Australia a number of years ago. Uh, but what he did was he just wanted to know whether mother could, um, was an important model to get animals to eat new food. So when lambs were six weeks of age, he uh, exposed them to a pan of wheat in three ways. One group got this wheat with their mother. One group got a pan of wheat, but they were alone in the pen. And the other group was the control and they didn't get any wheat. And then Dr. Green sent these lambs out into the outback or somewhere in Australia for a long, long time. And uh, during that time, they grazed and they had no access to wheat. They just grazed on range. And nearly three years later, 34 months later, um, he brought the sheep, the lambs back now, and they were young ewes, and he gave them wheat to eat. And he wanted to see if this prior experience with mother was influential, even though that was really limited experience. It was about an hour a day for five days that they had had early in life. And what he found was that it was it was very important. Animals that had no exposure, um, certainly didn't eat uh, any wheat at, at uh, three months of age. The ones that were alone didn't eat very much wheat at three months of age. When the ones with, the, with their mother, they ate a significant amount of wheat when they were young. And then almost three years later, the ones had, that had never seen wheat before and those that had had it only when they were alone in the pen ate very little wheat. But the lambs, the yellow bars here, that had been exposed to wheat when they were young, when they became ewes um, at 34 months of age, they ate a lot of wheat as if they it was a familiar food to them. Even though they had not had exposure to it for over 30 months, they still recognize it and start eating it. So it's clear that lambs learn from mother and they remember a long time. Another uh, interesting uh, experiment that was done by Sarwat Mirza and Fred Provenza on mother's influence uh, was when uh, they tried to get uh, to look at whether lambs formed preferences for serviceberry or mountain mahogany, whether when their mother had eaten it or not. So serviceberry mountain mahogany, two shrubs that sheep eat uh, willingly, and uh, one group of ewes were trained to eat service boy berry and to avoid mountain mahogany. Uh, Sarwat created an aversion to mountain mahogany in this case. 
And then uh, they tested lambs to see which foods that they preferred. So they, they used eight service berry, avoided mountain mahogany, then they grazed with their lambs for a number of times, and then they tested the lambs to see which foods they ate. And um, the, the lambs clearly ate service berry if their mothers had eaten it, and they avoided mountain mahogany, which their mothers had avoided, even very early uh, in the experiment. And that this lasted for quite some time, quite a number of experiments. So lambs eat what their mother ate. And again, it lasted at least two more experiments where um, Sarwat looked at this preference for service berry, and it lasted many days uh, and months into the future. So, uh, if your mother taught um, an if an, if a mother taught an animal to eat something uh, or uh, influenced its preference, that preference could last a long time into the future. If you're trying to create preferences for specific foods in a targeted grazing setting, uh, then having that food introduced to young animals with their mother is a really important influence um, and it's a really important way to get animals to eat uh, a food lot later in life. Peer influence is very powerful and uh, we've talked a lot about aversion and uh, this experiment here done by uh, Mike Ralphs uh, on tall larkspur was to see if animal social influences could uh, extinguish aversion. So let's say you worked on creating an aversion to a food or an animal had an aversion to a food, could the, the behavior of peers around that animal decrease the aversion? So uh, in this experiment, you'll see the data here, 1993, 94, 95, one group of cow cattle were averted to tall larkspur, so they, had, they ate zero bites of tall larkspur when tested in the field. A control group that had had no negative feedback um, uh, given to them after eating larkspur, continued to eat a few bar bites of it. Now remember, tall larkspur is very um, strong. It's, I mean, it's a very powerful toxin, but also remember that animals have mechanisms to consume a little bit of tall larkspur and most of the time below the, the, the lethal dose. So that's what was happening with these control animals. They were eating a few bites, but it was below a lethal dose. The experiment went along for several months, or years actually, and so you'll see the blue line is the controls. They kind of increased larkspur consumption, then would decrease the bites and over time. And the averted animals, when they were alone, when they grazed separately and away from the control animals, they did not eat any larkspur. They their aversion persisted throughout the whole trial, several um, years of trial. And then, Dr. Ralphs put the animals together, both the ones that ate larkspur and those that avoided larkspur together in one pasture. And immediately, nearly immediately, the ones that had been averted to larkspur for a long, long time, when they saw their peers eating it, they started eating it. And so um, it's kind of, um, I guess, disheartening if you're trying to create lifelong aversions of animals to toxic plants, that uh, it will last until they have some peers that start eating that toxic plant. We've been talking a lot about how animals make choices among foods. Uh, something we haven't uh, visited much about yet is how animals eat foods. Foraging skills are really important um, in, in an animal's ability to actually get the most nutritious part of foods or the least toxic part of foods. That might be a skill that the animal has to learn. And this experiment was, um, I'm going to describe an experiment that was done by Luis Ortega Reyes and Fred Provenza uh, to see if animals really do have to be trained not only what to eat, but how to eat it. So what Luis did is he had two sets of goats. I see one in the picture there. Uh, they were six and 18 months of age. So he was also interested in the age of animals and if animals do need to learn these skills when they're young and if they, the skills become harder to learn as they get older. So he had these young and not so young goats. Uh, they grazed on black brush pasture. A uh, black brush, Coleogeny ramosissima, is a plant that has, you know, small fascicled kind of bunched leaves, and they're hard to eat. The most um, new leaves and new stems, which are the most nutritious part of the plant. Oh, but they also have the most tannins in it in the plant. So the animal has to be very careful to eat the nutritious part and avoid the tannins. Uh, so what uh, Luis did was he exposed animals to black brush 0, 10, 20, and 30 days in, uh, pa in pens, and then he counted the bites per minute of black brush eating. So he's looking to see if animals do develop foraging skills. And it's clear that animals do develop 
uh, foraging skills. So the bottom line is 10. And then if you look at 20, those that had been exposed for 20 days and then those that had been exposed for 30 days, the longer animals were exposed, the better they got at eating at um, eating this black brush in terms of they could eat more bites per minute. And then also, if you see the left set of lines in that left um, uh, graph, those were the animals that were six months old, and they actually were able to learn faster and eat more than the animals that were 18 months of age. So even though 18 months is pretty young, that um, there still was a difference from animals that were six months old versus, versus a year and a half. So Lambs learn how to eat and age matters. Another interesting experiment was to see if animals that grew up in grasslands, for example, are better at eating grass. Um, and maybe animals that grew up in shrublands might be better at eating shrubs. That was the basis of an experiment that Enrique Flores and colleagues did to, to see how important these foraging skills might be in terms of an animal's nutrient intake. So we had two groups of sheep. One he, he raised and had um, access to crested wheatgrass in pots. The other group of sheep had um, service berry in pots and they had access to that while they were young. And after several um, weeks and months of exposure to these two uh, types of food, he looked at their ingestion of grasses and shrubs from both groups. And the grass eaters did tend to eat grass more quickly than the shrub eaters, than the ones that were raised on shrubs. And the shrub eaters tended to eat shrubs more quickly than the grass eaters. These were not huge, huge differences, but they could um, explain why animals that are um, raised on grasslands maybe do tend to eat grasses uh, more effectively and more efficiently than those that don't. And remember that if an animal is gaining more nutrients while eating, they'll form a stronger preference for that food. So. Something kind of simple that we had not really thought about before could really have strong implications about what animals eat well into their lives. And both of these last two experiments show that early experience tends to matter. So behaviors can change throughout the life, but they are based on early experiences of animals and that those are the most influential um, parts of an animal's life. Young animals are more likely to try new things and include more foods in their diet and they are more able to um, develop foraging skills. It's more likely to change their physiology, their neurology, and their structure of their body. So uh, that old saying, you are what you eat, in this case, you really are what you eat. If you eat food that changes your physiology and, and neurology. Here's an experiment that showed that change and how important early experience is. In this experiment, De Roberto Distel, Distel and Fred Provenza uh, exposed goats to black brush show the same type of goats, Spanish goats, and black brush that Coleogeny ramosissima goats were six weeks of age in this case. And the goats that were in the experienced treatment were raised on black brush range. Those that were in the inexperienced group were taken from black brush range before they had a chance to try it out and raised in dry lot on just on alfalfa pellets in a in the dry lot uh, setting. At 26 weeks of age, the lamb, the, I'm sorry, the kids were weaned and the kids were brought to a common area. And at 20 weeks, 28 weeks of age, after they got over being weaned, they were given an all you can eat black brush trial in pens. So animals were put in individual pens and they were given branches of black brush. And it's clear from the very beginning of the trial, day one through day seven, the experienced animals ate nearly three times the amount of black brush than the inexperienced animals. Remember in, the inexperienced animals, this is a kind of a new food to them. They really hadn't had it before in their lives, so it was new and they probably didn't have the foraging skills for it. And they may not have had the digestive capacity to deal with the black brush tannin. What's interesting is that this difference between experienced and inexperienced animals lasted a long time. So when they were at four months of age, you can see these data were the experienced animals ate significantly more than the inexperienced, but even 13 months of age, when they were over a year, you still could see this difference persisting with experienced animals eating more black brush than inexperienced animals. Some reasons that those experienced animals may have eaten more could be because it changed their morphology and physiology. So here were some rumens that were taken out of those the goats that were experienced and inexperienced. So the inexperienced animals are the ones that 
uh, the blue bar, the blue line, they had actually smaller rumens than the um, experienced animals. The experienced ones that were out on range, out on that black brush range, their rumen actually was bigger to facilitate taking in that higher fibrous diet, whereas the inexperienced animals that were on that were raised on dry lot, their rumens were pretty uh, small, and they were uh, designed to eat uh, diets that were more digestible and less fibrous. On the right hand side is uh, just an example, some pictures of rumens that might differ depending on the diet that an animal ate. The, the one on the bottom on the right was an animal that was raised on, on with a little bit of grain and a low fiber diet versus the one on the top which was raised on a high fiber diet. You can see it's much darker. It has more mineral content and uh, you can almost see the longer uh, papillae inside of the rumen. So it's really designed for um, eating fiber. So you are what you eat. Another ex ex uh, reason for this difference that uh, Dr. Distill found might have been uh, their physiology. So the inexperienced animals had lower le levels of glucuronic acid after eating black brush than the experienced animals. Okay, glucuronic acid is something that we use as an indicator for detoxification. So what was happening is the goats that were experienced on black brush, when they ate black brush, kind of kicked their system into a detoxification mode. So they really started um, using their uh, enzymes in their liver and in their detoxification system to get rid of those tannins in their diet. So experienced animals were better at dealing with the secondary compounds in black brush than inexperienced animals. So bottom line, these experiences interact. When an animal eats, it transforms the body, physiolo physiology, morphology, and neurology. The body then transforms experience. So those animals that, for example, were used to eating black brush had less negative consequences when they ate black, black brush. So they continued to eat it. And that therefore transformed their body, which made the negative consequences less, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you are what you eat, and it changes what you look like, and it changes your the feedback that you receive when you eat food. Okay, we've used mostly animal experience, uh, mammals, ruminants, etc., but it's the same for us as humans. Um, it's experience with eating transforms your body, and that transforms your experience with the food. A few take-home messages. Uh, nutrients and energy in food increase palatability. So foods that are nutritious and have good energy sources are more palatable or more preferred than others. Toxins decrease palatability. The stronger preferences and aversions are formed when feedback is very strong and, and occurs very quickly after eating. Um, also, animals avoid unfamiliar foods. We call that neophobia. And when they eat a food, an unfamiliar novel food, and it, and it causes either negative or positive digestive consequences, they tend to blame the novel food. Past experiences do give clues to, about the potential digestive consequences of new foods when an animal encounters them. And then finally, the experiences during foraging change the body, and that changes future preferences and intake of food. So those are just some real basics, and I have some references here that I will put online. Another page of references, if you go to our website, you will see these references. Again, our website, targetedgrazing.wordpress.com. At this site, you will find this and the other a series in this workshop, this online workshop. You'll find the five modules available uh, in a recorded form. You'll see these references. You can get uh, several handbooks that we have, including the Targeted Grazing Handbook um, online. We try to keep up with videos and presentations that we see or that we have recorded in our Targeted Grazing Committee. Would love your insight. Go ahead and uh, enter a comment into our webpage and we'll try to get back to you. So thanks for joining the Targeted Grazing Committee of the Society for Ranch Management in this online workshop on targeted grazing.